Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm Linda Katehi and I'm the Chancellor at UC Davis. I would like to thank you for joining us for the Chancellor's Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series. This is our fourth season of inviting renowned leaders in government, industry, the performing arts, and higher education to engage with our campus community about their work and to inspire us on issues of pressing concern for the environment, the future of education, the value of the humanities, and more. And we are so pleased today to have with us composer Mark Adamo. Mark will speak with Provost Ralph Hexter about his compositions and in particular, about his third full-length opera, The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, that will make its debut at San Francisco Opera this June. Also with us tonight are baritone Thomas Hampson, one of the world's preeminent classical singers, and two members of the renowned Jupiter String Quartet, which will be performing Mark's work here in Jackson Hall this Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. So let me first introduce our moderator for this evening, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor Ralph Hexter. Ralph is a distinguished scholar in classics and comparative literature and has written a lot about Mark Adamo's work. As an academic leader, Ralph has made it a priority to foster excellence across the full range of disciplines and to promote equal opportunity, diversity and inclusion for students, faculty and staff. Thank you, Ralph, for uh, agreeing to play this role tonight. Now I'm very honored to introduce our distinguished guest, Mark Adamo. This Wednesday, Thomas Hampson and the Jupiter String Quartet will perform the world premiere of Aristotle, a new song cycle by Mark Adamo, and that performance will take place here at Jackson Hall. The scores uses Bill Collins' long poem of the same name, to meditate on beginnings, middles, and endings, both as musical process for the quartet and as a reflection on life and its seasons. Mark's first two operas, Little Women and Lysistrata, have been widely produced and broadcast nationally and internationally since 1998. His third opera, The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, is scheduled to be introduced by San Francisco Opera, as I said before, in June of 2013. About halfway through this program, Mr. Hampson and the two members of the Jupiter Quartet, who are here tonight, violinist Nelson Lee and cellist Daniel McDonough, will join Ralph and Mark in their discussion. So please join me in welcoming Provost Hexter and composer Mark Adamo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor. And uh, Mark, I might tell you that in a way this academic year began with our uh, convocation and the Chancellor chose as the theme the arts. So this is in very many ways uh, a really fitting part of that series. And as you can tell, we have um, a wonderful temple to the arts here and elsewhere on campus. So it's a real honor to have you here premiering a work and then this ability to get an insight into some of your thoughts. Oh, thank you. It's, it's delightful to be here. And we had a beautiful rehearsal right on the stage not hours ago, so it's a very, already a very happy place for me. So I'm, 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 as a lover of music, um, I'm just in awe of folks who create and compose completely beyond me. How, how did you come to composition? When did you discover your, your gift and your, your, your love of, 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 and your desire to, to compose? Gosh, well, uh, the, the simple answer, or I guess the, the most empirical answer, is when I got my first piano, which was when I was 16. Um, so in, in, there, there is a way in which composition found me because I, I was in such awe of the music that I heard in recording or the music that I would hear other people perform both at the, you know, at the piano or in, in other contexts but it never occurred to me until uh, I was able to find an instrument that was um, small enough to fit in my living room and inexpensive enough for us to afford that I, I found myself obsessively drawn to it as, as one is and really as soon as I could um, develop any facility on the piano at all I started to, to write although it didn't feel at the time 
so much as I was writing as I was finding, you know, melodies or pieces that were already in the keyboard. You know, I, it's a, the, way, the ways in which the brain talks to, to itself. But sure, that was really how that began. And uh, but because I had come to it so late, and I had been uh, writing theater and performing in theater, uh, you know, obviously on an amateur basis, uh, as a child, I thought that the music would fold into what I was doing theatrically, and maybe if that the the summit of what I could attain, attain as a composer would be perhaps a, a, a composer lyricist for the theater. But no one was more surprised than I, really, when I then when I got to college and I was double majoring in music and then majoring in music at another university and getting the skills of being a composer and writing pieces that you write as a composer that I started getting commissions from music, musicians whom you would think would know better, do you know? Because <laughs> I had such a, an imposter syndrome you know, at that point that I thought, well, surely you know that while I am imitating a composer in my degree program, I'm really not that. A composer is someone who has written his first piano set on it at the age of nine, which was not me. Uh, but I loved it, that's what I was doing, and I kept writing pieces for the people who asked, and so ever so slightly my ambition began to shift. I thought, well, I will write for the theater, but maybe I can also do my own orchestrations as few but certain distinguished theater composers have, Leonard Bernstein in West Side Story principally, or maybe I can do other things along the way. And it was only really after um, being commissioned to do my first orchestral piece in Washington, uh, which was a piece called Late Victorians, that was uh, a great tribute you know, on, on the part of a, a chamber orchestra named uh, Eclipse in, in what I did. And when that performance went up, I, I'm being quite accurate here, I said, you know, I was at that performance and something happened and too many people believe in you for them all to be delusional. And it, it, it was the first moment that I thought maybe as unlikely as this is, this, this might be where you belong. And shortly thereafter, the Commission for Little Women came in and that's where we are. At that point, I, I kind of gave up any resistance to the note. I thought, okay, you're a composer, deal with it. So. Well, you know, um, that, was an, that is an unusual story, it strikes me, because you came to the theater first. Mm -hmm. So I'm, um, I'm, I, I have to then ask sort of a perennial question in opera. Um, Prima la musica e poi le parole. Oh, so see, first no. the music and then the words, or is it the other way around? No. Their whole opera's written around that question. Tom Hampson and I shared a hearty and exasperated conversation about this very issue, and I'll tell you why. Only because, and maybe I'm in a, a slightly privileged position here as my own librettist, and having been pretty thoroughly trained as a, as a writer of language for the theater, as well as a writer for, you know, of music for it, I, I firmly believe, certainly from a writing point of view, um, that it's neither one nor the other. It's this, it's this, you know, acted gesture toward, towards which both the music and the language are aiming. And if you read the people who are actually doing this, I mean, it's striking, for example, that you'll have very learned musicologists say, describe the works of Verdi as being works in which the music is preeminent, and then you read Verdi's first letter to his first lady Macbeth, in which he says, I implore you, should you come to a point where you feel you must serve either the composer or the poet, please serve the poet, because that is what the composer has done. Do you know? And so it, even the, the composers whom we think of as the most symphonically driven, the most the, whom you would associate with this idea that is, it is music first and the language trails off the back of the speedboat like a bunch of balloons. Well, if you think of Wagner, he is our only major creator to do his own libretti. And he had no sooner built that enormous theater at Bayreuth for that orchestra than he covered it so that the, the drama would be clear, the voice would be clear. And if you read the correspondence of any major uh, operatic um, author, for you know Britain, Strauss, Verdi, Puccini, the, the the stress on making the drama work, you know, which is not to say you know just getting the right words, but finding the fusion uh, is critical. And that's how you know how I, how I've always felt. If I can find what that character is doing, and some sense of 
if you will, how, how I would dance it, how the body language is going to give you that sense of what is meaningful um, to that person at that point, you will get a, a fragrance of what language and what music is going to ultimately marry to give you that living gesture on stage. Well, <clears throat> knowing how many dissertations and books are based on the correspondence between a composer and a librettist, mm -hmm. you've just destroyed the possibility <laughs> of generations of scholarship. But this allows me, since I can't talk to Wagner, um. uh, but, but so let me ask you when you, well, let's talk about some of the texts you've set. When mm. you took Little Women or Lysistrata, um, when you have text, you begin already to hear the music that goes with that text? Well, with those texts, because A, they're mine, and B, they are a, I mean, they're based on, by the time I get to set them, they're mine, Do you know? I mean, uh, with, with you know, apologies and respect to Alcott and, and Aristophanes, but mostly it's because those, by the time I get to a libretto, I've done these two outline phases, uh, one of which I've almost described to you now, the, the first of which I call the silent movie outline. If the opera is already written, and I am deaf, but it is being staged in front of me, and so I have no access to either language or sound, what um, is, the, is the design of, of the theater? You know, by, by which I mean, what characters come in, how do they come in, what actions do they perform? What is that going to tell me about the story I wish to tell? And so that will be, that will consist of lines like, Jo enters, flings herself on the couch, she picks up her diary, she buries it into a cushion. Laurie go, enters, reaches to touch her, draws his hand back before he does so. Now, none of that is either text nor song, but it gives you an idea of who those characters are, kinesthetically, that gives you some sense of what is at stake and what the narrative might be. And then I put that aside, or more specifically, I'll send that to every smart person who will take my calls and say, what story do you think I'm telling? And try to rewrite that as much as possible. And generally, at the end of that, you'll get the sense of what, what ideas are more important than others, what ideas might come back either identically or in other forms, which to me, if, if you are thinking at all motivically, musically. I mean, not to say that every that symphonic thinking stopped Beethoven, but if you're thinking of the balance of variety and repetition throughout a long evening to build an experience, well, those things that repeat in that outline give you a sense of where to go, a mm -hmm. sense of where the important areas of your drama might lie. Then you put that aside and you say, now I'm in the theater. Alas, I am deaf, but I have a sense of what is going on and I am hearing voices and orchestra, but I do not understand language. So given what I know about the motion of the piece, no language yet, but the, the motion and the stakes and the design of the event, what does that event sound like? If you've got someone saying, uh, and again, there's no language, but if everything is perfect, nothing needs to change, and she is singing something in which uh, that is stated, well, what harmony says it's not broken, we need not fix it. What harmony says we are happy where we are? And con conversely, if you have a character that, that is exalting the need for change or personal transformation, well, what would that tell you harmonically? What vocal texture might you choose? What, what are the phrases? Um, if in the first example, the phrases may come back to something quite regular, maybe this is a, a, a 10 beat line followed by an eight beat line followed by two four beat lines. I mean, you're just sketching this. But that's information. And by the time that you have put that through a number of drafts, by the time you get to the libretto, which is to come back to your question, by the time you get to those texts, well, it's the first draft of the script, but it's also really the first draft of the score because the language is already accommodating musical needs that you haven't articulated yet. There's no text to set, and you have not written you know, 12 bars of E major, but you have an idea of where you're going. So by that point, once the, the, the first draft of the play has more musical information in it than, say, the original Aristophanes or the Alcott would. When I, when I think of the operas that you've written and one that's about to premiere, mm -hmm. um, the, the texts arise out of very different backgrounds. One is based on a novel that many know. Mm -hmm. One is based on a, already a dramatic piece, although one very distant in culture, it requires translation at various levels. And then, I'm not even sure how you would describe the, the text of Mary Magdalene, which we don't, the Gospel of Mary, mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene, but of course, um, 
you really created it out of your own sense of a, of a I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking about this, sense of many texts. Mm -hmm. How did each of those vary, and how did you actually choose to come to the final version of the text that you set? Well, or this, set may be even the wrong way of describing no, it. No, it's, it, it, I've never done anything like this piece before yeah. because I didn't, I didn't know if it was possible until I did the research. Uh, I should back up a little bit and, and say that it, it's based on the Gnostic Gospels, the canonical Gospels, and the scholarship thereupon filling in the historical uh, links or, the, or the, the missing information about the historical context of those texts. And it's trying to imagine um, a human original of the story of Jesus of which all of those might be considered mythic variations. So the premise is that everyone involved is a human being. The premise is that the, uh, the miracles may have been um, uh, fabulous embroideries of things that may actually have happened but still belong to the world in which we lived. And the other premise is that you want to restore uh, or reimagine the female persona who were left out of the original. But I wanted, and of course, this is going to, by definition, involve um, adapting, dramatizing, imagining something, but I did want, if possible, to write a libretto about which I could obviously not say this is the way that it happened, but based on the text that we all share, no one could say it couldn't happen that way. So even the things that I wanted, I was what that I was going to invent, I wanted it to come from something. But until I did the reading, I didn't know what was out there. And what is out there, while it's quite rich, uh, is all fragmentary. None of it's primary. Almost none of it is secondary. There's a lot of tertiary sources. As a, I believe she is based here, the biblical scholar Rebecca Lyman said to me the last, I was, last time I was in San Francisco, uh, to be a biblical scholar is to realize very early on that you are working with six puzzle pieces out of a thousand, none of which fit together, all of which are blue. You know, <laughs> there's just, there's, there's more space, you know, than connection between all of these stories. But that said, when I, I wrote to David, uh, David Gockley, the producer, and said, this is what I would like to propose. All you really need to tell me is not a chance or maybe, because I don't know if it's possible. So before I, I went, undertook the process that I just described to you, I had to turn myself into a reasonable simulacrum of a biblical scholar and read all of those texts and read the people who had unpacked certain things that were hiding in plain sight, even in the gospels that we hear every Sunday. For example, if you hear in Mark, Mark, Luke, and John, it's in, all in the synoptics, when the elders say, isn't this Jesus Mary's son? Isn't James, aren't James and Joseph his brothers? Well, that seems like a perfectly innocuous phrase until you realize that, you, that a man was always identified patronymically, that is to say, son of his father. And the consistent reference of Jesus as son of Mary throughout the canonical gospels indicates that he was seen as having no legitimate father which is a clue that only the scholars will tell you. It's not really clear in the texts. So it was after reading it that I realized that there was actually, uh, particularly in the Gnostic Gospels of Philip and Sophia and Dialogue of the Savior, there was so much more possible detail, uh, not only about the story of Jesus and certainly the, the position of Mary Magdalene as his companion, the word koinonos in the Greek, which means exactly what it means in English. It could be companion, it could be consort in all but name. But the, the dynamics between Mary and Peter were astounding. When Mary says to the Savior, I am afraid of Peter for he threatens me and hates all my sex. It's just there in the text. Or, you know, when, when Peter says, make Mary leave us for females are not worthy of this life. And Jesus says, I shall make her male like the rest of you males and she will be you know, um, worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've placed that particular line in a context that I've made up, you know, and then I've developed that dramatically. But it really was very important to me not to use any medieval sources, so she does not sail to Provence and found the royal family. I mean, that's much, much later. I wanted to keep it within that first and second century web and to develop uh, a, a psychologically credible and, to my mind, nobler and nobler because more believable, more human version of that story that stayed within the consensus of what we found so far. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing the, the opera when it, when it opens in San Francisco, and I wouldn't be surprised if many of the people in the audience are. And we shouldn't talk all the time about the opera, but I have to ask you this. Okay. In the long 
history of opera, there's actually been a bit of, 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 re of resistance, sometimes actually open resistance to mm -hmm. putting biblical stories. And mm -hmm. the closer you get to the life of Christ, the greater the resistance. I, it's hard for me. That's one of the reasons you have oratorios and, right. and actually, or the passions. Um, you know, probably the, the most common biblical operas, the Samson and Delilah right. and the Salome. At, at a are safe distance. distance from, so there yes. you have put Jesus, or as I think you call him, Yeshua, Yeshua mm -hmm. on the stage. I just have to ask you, how, have, how, how did you feel about that? And w were there tensions that you felt or resistances, even yourself, or dangers that you needed to avoid? Uh, well, what's the, the word I'm looking for? Yes, there, there, were, there was resistance to the idea. I was, you know, I was, well, does he have to be on stage? It might interest you to know that Wagner attempted a life and teachings of Jesus Christ, abandoned it, and turned to Parsifal. And there, there was the, the question of whether if, if he is talked about but does, but does not appear. But it seemed to me, honestly, I, I mean, we are in a, a religiously contentious time, although what time is not. But it seemed to me that it, it was time for someone to write this not from the, either an atheist or a believing stance, that whatever else the Christian story is, it belongs to all of us culturally, you know, as, as well as whether we were brought up in, in that uh, religion. And the, it, it seemed to me that the, so much, in, in a way, as Wagner did not with the Abandoned Jesus um, opera, but with The Ring, that it seemed to me not only worthy, but urgent, as he did with that, to take a foundational myth of that uh, area of Northern Europe and revisit it in terms of the time and place in which he lived. And I was excited by the project simply because no one had done this and because, um, because this was going to be a piece for a large stage. This is a grand opera. You, you might know the War Memorial Opera House. It is an orchestra of 80. It is a chorus of 48. It is a cast of 17. It is a grand opera. And to me, I thought you need something that is not simply opulent, but you need an idea that we'll take a theater that is the closest equivalent that we have to the amphitheater of Epidaurus, you know, a place where a large segment of the culture comes to talk about itself, you know, it comes to a safe place to talk about dangerous things. I thought this notion of looking at the myths that we have, and I use myth not in the sense of lie, but in the sense of, you know, a story that we tell ourselves in order to organize our moral imaginations. I thought we need to look at this myth because we are living by it, you know, and, and there are consequences that come from the interpretations of our religious myth. I mean, myths, the, the obvious, of course, you know, being a, if, if, uh, an, interpretation, an interpretation of Islam that would lead to 9-11. But within our own traditions, you know, the uh, tradi an interpretation of Christianity that would lead to its policies towards women, which I think we can all agree are fraught, do you know? Its policies towards uh, sexuality in general, uh, for which you know, female personae are, are made to carry the burden, but which fall on e all of us equally. Uh, a lot of our attitudes from, about that are inherited from you know, this, uh, the myths that we have gotten, either through our faith traditions or the way those faith traditions have leaked out into the world. And I, thought, I really thought that it was, it was time um, to engage that. I thought that I, I had, I've lived a lot of the conflicts that I have, um, you know, that I am re-examining here through, through the personae of these characters. You know, I have, I have lived in my own life kind of the conflict between what uh, conventional religion wants me to be and who I feel I, I am meant to be, and I don't think I'm alone. And so that, that, that's really what was the impetus to say, yes, you must bring Jesus on stage. You must have Mary Magdalene ask him the questions that we would all like to ask him, were we there? And she, as it turns out, supported by the, these texts, is in a position intelligibly to do so. You yourself were talking about the role of women. Yes. And it, it seems almost inevitable, and maybe you've been asked this before, but in the three operas I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. you have... Ver women with agency. Um, yes. Certainly, um, it's one of the things we love most about Little Women. Um, of course, Lysistrata, the revolt of, of the women and that famous sex strike, and of yeah. course now Mary Magdalene. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? You know, it's, it's odd uh, because 
I, I sense often it isn't. I mean, a Little Women kind of you know, began this, and Little Women was not my idea. But of the, the many issues I had with it, you know, what is the piece about, what's the dramatic shape, it simply did not occur to me that I couldn't write it because I happened to have a Y chromosome. And I don't know if that's generational or if it's because I grew up in a family uh, with three very different and very um, uh, strong female presences, uh, my mother and my two sisters. And it, it was a big Italian family, so predictably, you know, it was loud, it was multivocal. I sometimes tell the joke that everything I learned about opera, I learned from my family's arguments, and, except for orchestration. You know, it's my family plus the, you know, written and sounding rage of the English horn. Um, but so when it, it, when it came around to, to do Little Women, I thought, well, I, I've been in her situation. I mean, if, if I were going to write a story that really, um, you know, took place with a woman and, and, and was, was concentrating on the minute changes in her body over a month, I would probably feel a little less comfortable, you know, or I would do a lot of research and ask all my female friends. But I mean, it, it seems to me that once you accept the premise that women are human beings with uh, differences, but with more, I feel like I have more in common with women than not, you know, it, uh, it, didn't, um, it didn't seem difficult. But I will add one thing to this. Uh, ambivalently, because I, I was reading uh, something in, in Slate. There was a series of small uh, essays on, the, uh, on, on the, this matter of camp, which is not something that I've particularly been attracted to. But one of these micro-essays asked, why does that particular sensibility seem so drawn uh, to women? And it said something that really stuck in my head, and that's why I want to repeat it. It said that to the extent that camp is aware that a uh, woman as a role in society, in Mildred Pierce, you know, is a, it's kind of a, a, a socially defined role that people happen to play. If you look at um, men versus women, women simply have more range as human masks. You know, they can be every bit as strong as men, and then there's a whole other aspect of the way they, they deal with men and the way they deal with their children and whatnot that is, is more... Um, it offers more to an artist. And I thought, well, I'm not really liking the particular subject of this essay, but that's kind of true in many ways. There's a lot, for a dramatist, there's, there's a lot that women, um, they, they, are, they are a great canvas for a dramatist on which to paint, if you will. And I was reminded of Michael Chabon's um, uh, actually comparable uh, um, speech about this, because the novelist of uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner for The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, and you might know, um, oh, what's the new piece? Uh, the um, the, the Berkeley piece. It was just here it in, was, in it speaking. Was, not here, well, but it, but he's Francisco. very interested in, uh, in writing male characters because he says, you know, if you, ha you have friends, you have fathers and sons, you have lovers, you have business partners. Those are kind of the roles, you know? And he, one of the reasons that he's chosen the subject that he's chosen is that he really wants to dig into, you know, the nuances of male emotion that have, have been underrepresented because men have not always been um, uh, encouraged, I guess, maybe to, to use their entire human ranges. Forgive me if I'm... I'm you know, stating that badly. But you get my point. There, there is something. There's so much that you can do. Uh, with, with women characters that, that pertain to all of us, that I, I seem to have, have found my way there. Let me ask a very, very different question, and it has to do with music yes. and so-called classical music. Do you mm -hmm. think that classical music is different from other kinds of music, or how do you think about the whole universe of music that is both being created and listened to, and well, What's I, classical music? I think it, well, I guess it depends on what we're talking about. I mean, the, the role has always changed. I mean, if, if it started really as an attempt to recreate what Greek drama might have sounded like, and it became uh, an aristocratic entertainment, and then a, a bourgeois entertainment, and then uh, you, you could argue now, if you're talking about, I mean, for example, I mean, Carolyn Shaw, who just won the Pulitzer, who was a violinist and a singer and wrote this mad, fabulous piece, you should hear it. Uh, it's called Partita, uh, and for the, this chamber choir called Roomful of Teeth, 
and it's all, it's vocalises and, you know, Tuvan throat singing and all, you know, clicks and speech and whatnot. And when she won the Pulitzer, she said, I haven't really been thinking of myself as a composer exactly. I've thought of myself as a musician, do you know? So, I mean, that's the, the, the uh, this is another way of looking at uh, what it is we do. I mean, I, I have mostly um, written for traditional forces, you know, and I guess to the extent that that's been uh, my background, I could say two things. One is that um, it may not be that uh, classical music, say, in the 19th century, as it was in Germany, uh, sits at the, the pinnacle of cultural aspiration, but I am not entirely sure that's a bad thing, because in two aspects, uh, one historical and one acoustic, I think it actually now can act, at least for us, in the, in the wired 2013 United States. Um, as kind of a, I don't want to say countercultural because I think that's too truculent an adjective, but as a way from which to, or a stance from which to look at the world in which we live, which is a world of big data, which means it inclines towards the eternal now, you know, the Twitter feed, the updated blog, you know, the, the 24, 48, however many news channels we listen to. Um, and the concomitant point is that as an acoustic form in a, in a wired world, you know, there, there is something about both the, the historical self-consciousness and, and the actual sound of what we do that even if it is dealing with contemporary subjects gives us a way of, of making it more immediate acoustically and linking it with uh, a tradition that pre-exists us and on the shoulders of the giants of which we all stand. Do you know what I mean? If I'm writing this piece for, for Tom and the Jupiters, uh, it's a contemporary poem, and it feels very contemporary in its diction and its subject matter, uh, which I love, because I, I don't get a chance to do that as often as I would like. But it's also not the first time that I have written for, an, you know, for that anyone has written a setting of a poem for an acoustically organized voice for a string quartet. And so even as the poem could or was maybe written four years ago, and the piece was written this year, you're simply by the fact of the forces, the fact of this auditorium and this stage and, and the artists that we're using, we're in dialogue with the past. And we're in dialogue with, and we exist by definition unwired. And I think, those are, I think those are great things and they're not necessarily something that you get in other forms of music. You know, I think that's our, it's not the only distinction that we have, but I, I, like, I like being unplugged and knowing that um, where we come from is older than, than yesterday. It was, of course, as a classicist that, I, that we first yes. met uh, since I wrote something about Lysistratus. So it's interesting that you've chosen a poem whose title is Aristotle. Yes, well... So, t you know, do, do you have a, a fascination with the Greeks? What is it about that text and that poem, or is it just accidental that it's, that refers to, you know, the, 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 the great, the stagirite, as they used to call him, the yes. philosopher? From well, it, it, is, it is actually accidental, because I, I, do, I do love his poetry, but the, the it was only when I, I was looking, uh, my publisher, I'm, I'm a, an exclusive uh, composer at Shermer, and so they have all my works, and they were updating the page, and I was looking at the title and thought, I, you know, I, I, my entire imagination is bounded by Bullfinch's mythology. But the, um, it is true, and I'm quite serious about that, that when I, I was growing up, I did, I did read all those things. I mean, not necessarily in the Greek, obviously not having had that, that background, but I was always drawn to those stories. And um, I mean, while, while the piece itself, I think is, uh, the subject matter of it is, is very, this world, you know, the climbers pulling on their long woolen socks and, you know, the curtain rising on a bare stage. The form of it and the, the, the very subject, the, the reason why it's called Aristotle is that it's, it's in three long sections and it is bouncing off Aristotle's theory of dramatics, uh, of dramatic shape, which that we have. His is, you know, we have a, a exposition, we have a conflict, um, agon, uh, a conflict development, agon and denouement. And how Collins deals with that is uh, just beginnings, middles, and endings in which those other two stages are implied. And so even as, formerly it's very simple. This is the beginning, list of beginning images. This is the middle, list of middle images. This is the end. It does form this, this very classical rising and falling shape. 
And I guess maybe another way of answering that question, which Collins has just done for me, is that but what's the great quote? The past isn't dead, it isn't really past. Mm. Do you know? I mean, one of the th things that, that I experience when you see these pieces is how, not how much, but how little they've changed. You know, that the, the, the human concerns, regardless of whether we're talking about the Sicilian exposition or, you know, where Iphigenia has found herself imprisoned, you know, in this particular play, we're still talking about the, the, the same issues that we are dealing with as contemporary people. And to my ear, and actually to Aeschylus's ear too, because it, what it surprised me in doing research for Lysistrata is that there was really no such thing as classicism ever. There was only neoclassicism, by which I mean there was only the mask of the past put, kind of placed on contemporary events to make it easier for a contemporary audience to see themselves in it without being distracted by, if you will, a journalistic you know, that the events of the Oresteia were a hundred years in the past, but in many ways, the, the piece was absolutely about contemporary Athens. So that, that is, you know, I guess that's one of the reasons I, I'm so drawn, particularly to Lysistrata. Because actually, in all, in, not so in Little Women, but the, the, uh, the second opera and the third opera both share the same um, description on the title page. The time is now, the place is ancient Greece. Or, in, in the case of the new piece, the time is now, the place is first century Galilee. You know, I think that's really the stance of, of art. So the time is now, and it's time <laughs> to bring out the other members of this panel. That means we're at the middle. So let's continue the discussion with Thomas Hampson, baritone extraordinaire, violinist Nelson Lee, and cellist Daniel McDonnell of the highly acclaimed Jupiter String Quartet. Um, please, come on. So, Tom, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, is it Nelson and Daniel? Yes. yes. That's correct. So, um, thank you for joining us today uh, at this moment when you're very much engaged in creating a, a new work, uh, uh, Mark Adamo's l latest work, which will be premiering on, on Wednesday. So, we've talked a little about Aristotle um, and about the poem. I, let me ask the other three of you, how did you first come to this work and what did you make of it when you first saw it on the page? Tom, why don't we start with, with you if we could? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, good afternoon. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, uh, layers to, to how a project this, like this comes together. And I think it's very important just to recognize this rather amazing consortium of presenters called Music Accord in the country, uh, 10 different presenters that are committed to keeping the chamber music art form alive and commissioning new pieces and finding artists that want to do these pieces and challenge themselves. And so the first conversation was probably with me and I think this project originated uh, on the table anyway in New York with, the, with uh, Wuhan at the uh, Lincoln Chamber Music Society. And um, it was sort of, uh, well, we'd like to find a composer, we'd like to do this, we want to find a text, and would you like to do it, and you like new music, and, and I said, you know, yes to all of those. Uh, and then there was a handful of composers that seemed to be you know, predestined for this project, and, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer with Mark. Uh, Mark and I have known each other for some time, and had never worked together before, but I'm a great admirer of his music, uh, and of course his partner too, John Corleano. And so, you know, my remark was, yeah, call Mark and if he'll do it, wow, wouldn't that be exciting? Um, then somewhere after that process, and his, his answer was sort of yes. <laughs> and I mean, it's just fun how these things build together. And, and then Mark and I got together and talked about texts. And, and one of the first things I said to him is that, you know, the, all the new pieces that I've been, been given or have been presented, you know, all, all have this sort of malarian, oh my God, thing to it. Uh, and that's all well and good, but wouldn't it be fun to find something uh, more pithy, more contemporary, perhaps even funny, uh, a kind of monologue, a kind of, a kind of contemporary discussion of things that mean life now, rather than always going for this larger, uh, bigger, bigger picture. And, and Mark was very open to that idea and, and threw out some ideas. We talked about it, and then we kind of separated and didn't have much contact after that. And you were reading a lot, and I was thinking about a lot, and, and pretty soon here comes, here comes uh, you know, condensing the story to, to readability here. Uh, uh, you landed on this rather remarkable poem uh, by Billy Collins, um, 
obviously one of the most cherished and well-known contemporary poets. Uh, and I've certainly known his work because of my work at the Library of Congress and all that sort of thing. So here, here it comes, and Mark, Mark sends me this poem. He says, I think this thing almost writes itself. <laughs> and this is one of the big differences between those of us that study and learn and, and, and try and follow the footsteps of the creative uh, geniuses and, and the others. I thought, you know, good Lord, you know, interesting poem. What on earth is this ever going to sound like in music? And, um, and in fact, I, it, it's just been a fascinating experience because I actually understand the poem uh, better because of, because of Mark's setting. So my first reaction to the poem was, was enthusiastic and, and exciting, and I get it, and it was really had to be Mark's, it has to be Mark's inspiration. It has to be something that says, I need to put this to music. And, and if I may dovetail into your conversation about, about prima musica, quale parole, for me, it, this is, these are, this is a, a, an answer to a question that shouldn't be asked. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm sorry, there are these volumes of, of, of <laughs> various scholarly literature trying to analyze the actual answer to that question, but it unfortunately is a waste of time. It has to be a merge. It has to be the same tone and symbol of wood. So when I finally did get this, and uh, we've had various waves of gestation, uh, it was just very exciting to see how the poem fleshed itself out in a tonal language and vice versa. And right prima facie, one of the most interesting things to me anyway as a singer was, this is truly a piece written for string quartet with text and with a singer. And so it becomes really a quintet. And it was, it's just, you know, it's been really a lot of fun to, to get the teeth into. And, and, uh, and there's certainly challenges. We had a, we had a hard rehearsal today. and, and uh, uh, there was no, at no point, an exasperation, but this isn't, you know, this isn't a, it isn't a walk in the park either. <laughs> so was today your first rehearsal? It was the first rehearsal, first time we've ever met each other. We've yeah. obviously known about one another and uh, in, in various permutations. So, so let me ask the members of the, of the quartet, how did you come into this project and what did you think of Aristotle by Adamo? Well, um, we got to know Aristotle by Adamo really for the first time this morning. I mean, we had only in front of us um, a score and the quartet part, and we could do a horrible job of trying to imitate Tom's part. Oh, we um, had some funny rehearsals. We had some very <laughs> funny rehearsals where one trying of us to sing it, tried yeah. to sing, and it was just <laughs> god-awful. Um, so uh, we worked very hard to try to understand what it would sound like and how to interpret um, the, the text um, and, and how really to communicate the text instrumentally. We have a very unique position in that we don't, we don't really get to say anything um, like Tom does. Uh, so uh, we, we, we had to, to find the colors uh, that would suit um, the words that, that Billy Collins wrote and that Mark um, so beautifully interpreted with music. So um, that was our big job. So we got the score in the mail, and we just kind of tried to figure it out uh, without mm. having Tom around. Unfortunately, Tom, you know, he's, he's very busy. <laughs> it's kind of an, it's so, just, please. Oh, I was just going to add on to this. It's just kind of an amazing thing to, you know, to get the score in the mail. And, you know, we've known about the project for a couple years now and have been really excited about it. And then to get the score, and there's, you know, obviously no recordings or any sort of um, precedent for it performances of this piece. So to just learn it for the first time on these really fresh ears and it was a really exciting process for us to get to get it and to work on it as a quartet. And then to finally put together with Tom this morning was amazing. But um, I think something that we all really appreciate uh, when we get a commission work like this is I think Mark was very clear in his, his directions in the music. It's, mm. it's, it was very clear from the start sort of what he was going for. And the, the, as you'll hear um, in the concert, the, the music is very diverse. Like it switches from section to section on a dime, and there are lots of different colors happening to, to illustrate the different sections of the poem. And I think he's very clear about wh what ex colors he exactly wants us to demonstrate. So that made actually our job a lot easier in some ways. So, so Mark, I've, I've held you to unwanted silence for a couple of minutes here. <laughs> but so We've I want to ask. So. <laughs> I've, you know, we've, we've just heard Tom's speaking voice, which is, you know, a, for those of you who don't know, quite a sense of the, of, the, of the beautiful singing voice. We're not hearing the Jupiter sonorities right at this moment, at least not when they're playing their instruments, but how much were those sounds that you knew of 
Tom Hampson, Thomas Hampson's voice or the Jupiter Sonorous, how much oh. of that was in your creative process? And oh, what? totally, totally. I mean, I, I have to bounce off uh, something that Tom said because it was absolutely true that when my representative said, uh, you know, you've, we've got this inquiry for a piece for uh, Tom Hampson, the Jupiter String Quartet, I did say yes. I said yes in 24 point font and I said it in about <laughs> three seconds because as I know that, you know, none of you, this will surprise exactly none of you here, but this is one of the great singing actors of, of this or any generation, and I've been following his work forever, so it was a thrill, you know, beyond anything, actually, to be asked to do this. And I had not known of you before, but Kristen Lancino, who used to lead Chamber Music Society mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center, and is now uh, my publisher, uh, had said brilliant things, and so I, knowing, knowing that, I mean, I think any composer does that. If you have the privilege of knowing that you are working, mm -hmm. you know, for... The a, performers that you know, and B, performers that you know on this level. I mean, how are you not going to use uh, the, the colors that they have? You know, because, particularly with, you know, when you deal with the human voice, because, I mean, an F natural is just a series of vibrations, you know, per pitch. But in, if one particular person's um, F natural is a color, it's a decision, it's a choice. And if you don't use that in your composition, well, then you need to be doing something else. <laughs> so, I mean, very much in, in working this, it was, you know, because I, I had known Tom's voice both on recording and in, um, you know, on stage. It was like, it's not just where, I, you know, I, I want this to be D. It's like, no, I want this to be at this particular area where it's brilliant and there are still options, do you know? Or this particular area where, where it's, it's mellow, but there's still brilliance or something. You know, that, that kind of painting with it. Which is why I have to say that it was such a thrill to... I, I, the, you have a very effective shell here, because I actually walked backstage. You were rehearsing and I didn't hear you. And then I walked backstage again and heard, you know, it was, it was the uh, a song of betrayal, Salted with Revenge. And it, it was just Christmas morning for me. I thought, ah, there it is. <laughs> Not only have I wandered into the right place, but that was the sound. That was the sound that I had, you know, hoped that it would be. So, um, yes, the short answer is yes, I guess. You do think <laughs> of those things. Well, so, um, I mean, I'm going to take some risks here. So, um, Tom, did he get it right? Did I get what right? <laughs> did he get it right? Did, did I what? When, in terms of your feeling about singing this song, was it, in your view, written for your voice? Well, that, that, yeah, I appreciate the question, and, I, and, I, and the answer is yes, but that's not how I measure it. What, what, what impressed me with and what impresses me with Mark's music and Mark's lyrical music specifically is, is his phenomenal belief and command in, in how words express themselves. And, and it's been fun to, to learn this, as you were, uh, Daniel, expressing how you guys you know, learning this piece and starting from scratch and so forth. Just looking at the page, I can't help but smile because I can hear Marco Damo narrating or reciting this poem to himself. I can, I can hear how he's thinking, how does, this, how does this phrase work? And am I, you know, with poetry very often, it's, it's, it's very much decision sometime when you're reading poetry, which I enjoy doing, not just for myself, but, but physically. I think we should read more poetry to one, one, one another. Poetry is about the imploding, the imploding of, of emotion and recognition of life's successive moments in a particular context, it seems to me. And as much as there is a narrative involved, it's always the, the stuff that sticks, the stuff that stays and, and makes you think about something in another association that is, to me, the more powerful part of poetry. And, and so it was very interesting to see how Mark was approaching that. And, and, and finding his language, both musically but also rhythmically. And it's the kind of piece that you could hand to someone who doesn't speak English and say, if you want to learn how to speak English or understand how our language works, learn this music, sing this this way, you'll understand that. I, I would say the same thing about Gustav Mahler's songs. If you want to really learn German, sing some Gustav Mahler songs. That's, that's, that's how it works. The, the verb is at the end of the sentence and, and the four bar phrases pile onto one another and so forth. And, and so the same thing is, is with, this, with this piece. And um, uh, for, for, for me, whether it fits my voice or doesn't, um, is slightly too vain for me to say, but but I feel like he has given me all the, the tools that, I, that he knows I have to, to make this rather profound poem by Billy Collins audible so that other people will find 
their life inside of what Mr. Collins has written. Yeah. I realize as I turn to the Jupiters that the classical theme continues in the name of your, your quartet. But, but <laughs> so you talked about the words and that, of course, the, the baritone Tom is, is singing them. In your process, creating, interpreting, what is, the te- what is the role of the text itself? Is it, you know, to put it provocatively, is it, is it just the sounds, or is the, does the meaning actually um, come, house, come in somehow in the way that you develop, the way you play it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, as Nelson said before, our job was made very easy because the, the clarity of his writing uh, was apparent immediately, so we didn't really have to sit there and try to figure out how the text and the music work together. Um, and there were two di- there are basically two different levels that we had to study the score on. One is kind of a micro level where Marcus occasionally, and in a very original way, in an uncliched way, um, painting the images um, that, that Billy Collins has created. Like, cause this, the poem is, in a way, a series of um, little images put together. Mm-hmm. So um, Mark has this one job of, of, kind of coloring each image or describing them with notes. Um, and then, more impressively, on the large level, the piece has to kind of work um, as a whole. Uh, so there has to be structure, obviously, with each stanza, beginning, middle, and the end, but that's quite obvious, I think. And the brilliant thing, I think, that he did was that he found structure inside each stanza so that it's not just kind of obvious three-section. Um, it really does kind of move together. And so we have, to, we, ha- we have to kind of understand it both on that small level and how we want to bring those words to life in our instruments, but also understand how to make the piece work this way, but again, it was, it was quite easy because of his wonderful talent. Just to give a um, couple little examples of what Daniel was talking about in terms of how we were interpreting the text and with Mark's music. So, um, there is one, um, there's one quote from the text about a, a wriggling fish, <laughs> and along with that line, he has us playing this quick sextuplet figure in, with, in this very sort of wriggling contour. So, I mean, he didn't specifically write sound like a wriggling fish, but then it was clear to us that that's what he was trying to represent. So there are a lot of little examples like that or like a billowing uh, gush of wind that he's trying us to... So then we have this like rush of sound through the quartet that's kind of not very clear, but it sort of projects that, that image. And then I think in a more abstract sense, like he has us representing the tone of the text for when the song of betrayal comes into, it's a very majestic section where Tom climaxes on this F major chord. And um, so I think in that sense, like, that it's just coming through in the character of the music much less than a sort of like uh, literal representation of the image in the, in the text. So there are a lot of these little examples of that happening all over. And I think they'll be apparent to the, to the listener for sure. It's such a unique opportunity for us as people who will be hearing this on Wednesday and to be talking to, to you who are involved in in your rehearsal today, um, would you feel comfortable talking about any kind of interesting, um, and shall we say, disagreements you, you, that might have emerged, or where there were tensions? I can understand if you don't, but you know, it would be fascinating. <laughs> you first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there were any disagreements at all, actually. No, I definitely. think it's no. just... Any discoveries? Yeah, it was discoveries? an interesting dialogue. It was great that, that one, it's great that Mark's here, and, and it's... And it's you know, this, this whole process is so exciting. It's why we all sign on to these kinds of projects. It's, I think it's so important for musicians uh, for us to have this, this relationship with living composers and, and supporting and writing and, and performing new works. And, and we need to bring our public with us. We need to invigorate the incitement that we have. And I think it informs us how to approach works of dead composers. I mean, quite frankly, you referenced Verdi and Wagner, and we're in the Verdi-Wagner year as well as Britain year. Britain's a little closer to us. We have more first-hand evidence of people that worked with him and, and knew him very well. But there, this was always the way it's done. This is, how it was, this is why we all read the letters. This is why we try and find as much information as we can. You know, your remarks about women remind me very much of Mozart. It's exactly what he wrote 
in the operas. It's exactly what he was looking for. The fleshing out of the, of the real human compassion was in the, is in the women's figures, you know. And unfortunately, he left a lot of us as, as male figures in sort of blocks along the way, but that's okay. We'll talk about this some other time. But the point is, it's just this lively discussion of finding out. And, and, and actually, you know, Mark's been very detailed, and, and he has a wonderful wonderful the sense of dynamic markings, which I appreciated a great deal that had more information to me than just, you know, this, this god-awful thing called a metronome, which is a, some kind of indication of, of a heartbeat at, at a particular point. But there were a couple of places where, I, where, where actually we were stumbling around. I was actually going on, I think it should be slow or something like that. And Mark came and said, well, no, actually, you know, let's keep on going here. Let's, <laughs> let's keep this moving. So we had to sort of talk about where that's going. Those are not, a, those are not disagreements, you know, uh, at all. Um, uh, and I, I think that, you know, or, 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 or for the quartet to find, to find, you know, they're very used to themselves as a, as a quartet, but, you know, the, here comes this interloper called an octogenarian <laughs> singer. And, you know, let's, let's see if we can stay in the same sense of now, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and for me, I'm extremely oriented towards the expression of the words in a musical language, and, and it's certainly not in any way to be confused with accompaniment, but it's a different kind of articulation for a, for a quartet to be setting up different phrases, new phrases, and I had to explain to him, well, actually, this word and, and, and is going, or this phrase. And if I may say what you're responding to, Daniel, it, it is the genius of Billy Collins' poem, because you have this, at one point, sort of third-person narrative, which becomes the first-person experience, and he sort of goes back and forth in this relationship to the, in his own story uh, through, the, through the whole 15-minute you know, monologue. And, and at some point, uh, this huge mirror just comes up, and it's, and it is all this summation of parts that we take along with us in a, in a language that is so immediately recognizable to anybody sitting in this room or anybody that will hear it. It's, it's really, it's a remarkable, you know, because that is the remarkableness of Billy Collins that's been written about and is recognized today. But um, just grappling with these very, very tools is what is what is so exciting what we do. So I don't think we had any big disagreements. I mean, I think you're doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark he, did, did the performance, I mean, you, 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 you said, oh, this is what I wanted, but did you make new discoveries about your own creation? Yes, yes. I was, I was just going to, uh, trying to think if I had anything to, to add to this conversation. And I, I, I think you learn this really um, anytime you go into a rehearsal process, but I, I learned here, well, two things. One, I think that it is um, kind of my particular thing, which I have to learn over and over again, which is that very often I, I will try to make a decision either with, with a dynamic marking and with a tempo alteration at the same time, and you really only need one or the other. So, for example, we had that big B-flat chord, and it's, it was a, 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 the subito pianissimo, and I put a fermata over the eighth note, and you realize you're gilding the lily. Mm. In many ways, mm. that change of thought is made audible by the, the change in dynamic, and then if you put this, if you, if you are distorting the rhythm, then it's another thought, and it's too much. And partly because, as, as we've talked about, I, I'm principally working um, you know, with singers, which is one of the reasons why it's so exciting for us to be doing this, because this is my first big chamber commission. I mean, generally, I do things that take years and involve thousands of people, so it's so <laughs> lovely to have five of us in a room and we're the whole thing. It's <laughs> like, but the, um, but part, uh, in writing that, I, I tend to think because there is a... Um, Flexibility is the cliche, but there, there, there's a humanity. You want something not mechanistic mm -hmm. in a vocal utterance. And because that's the, the value that, that I, I put very highly in both my instrumental and my vocal writing, I tend to think that my rhythm is looser than it is. So I will have exactly, as Tom you know, said, can, can we slow this up? But I would say, please don't. You know, because, because, I mean, exactly, for exactly this, because it, it's already there. Mm -hmm. And in a funny way, it, it seems more self-conscious rather than less mm -hmm. if if we announce the tempo right. change. And again, I wouldn't, you know, if, if he had asked me over the phone, oh, can we take more time here? I would have said, sure, in theory. And then had to say, oh, please, actually. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's that, that balance between um, precision in the service of seeming spontaneity, you know, which is a balance well that, you, that you find anew with every mm -hmm. piece. I think you were all listening to what we were saying before, and, mm -hmm. you know, I asked 
Mark, about classical music, and I'd like to broaden that discussion. Um, for those of us who are, are fans of classical music, I think in a world where so much of the consumption is of electronic, well, I should say, um, as you put it, wired, yeah. and, and, and so much, it's a very, very different style. I think some of us are concerned about the future, but I'm, I'm wondering if I could just draw you all out on that issue is in your own work of doing chamber music or opera and song. And of course, Mark himself exemplifies that uh, opera is far from dead, we know that. Um, it's quite an amazing renaissance, but I would just love to hear whether you uh, resonate to, to Mark's distinction between the acoustic and, and the wired, or if you think that there are other things that are essential to the classical register. I, can, can you, I was fiercely practicing, I'm embarrassed to say, practicing uh -huh. Mark's piece during the first 45 minutes. So you're asking basically um, whether we feel that, that the acoustic music is being overtaken by popular music? Or are you asking about an electronic version of classical music? You, you say it, Mark. I, I, yeah. Just earlier. And thank you for practicing. Yeah, sure. Uh, but the, um, the, I just said, because the, the question of, you know, what is concert music today or what makes it unusual, and there are any number of answers to that. But I, I, the only thing I said was that the idea that we are an acoustic form in, you know, a, a largely mediated world, and that we are no, um, a, a form that is so very historically self-conscious. You know, I mean, as you, you were not the first people to, to play two violins and a viola and a cello at the same time. <laughs> we're, we're standing on shoulders. You know. I thought those, those two things that, that remove, if you will, is actually a rather lovely thing for concert music because it gives us a unique stance from which to comment on, on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, with which you may agree or may not, but that's, I think that's what you're asking. Right, and yes, I was also interested for all of you who are practitioners is what you think about the, the, the challenges of being a classical musician today. Of having so much history behind us to deal with, in mm -hmm. a way. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, that's a big question. Um, but one of the things that, that gives me a lot of joy is that we don't just play... Um, the music from the past. I mean, having the opportunity to do um, this piece, um, especially in the context of the rest of the program, um, which is based in the past, um, I think is, is one of the most wonderful parts of my job. I don't think that I would want to be a classical musician if I didn't get to play new music. Um, so I, it's hard for me to really really think of myself only in terms of the past. I actually think mm -hmm. that, you know, of course the past informs the way we play, uh, and, and Mark is obviously writing for a classical formation of, of instruments, but um, just, just creating something new, or helping to create something new. You did all the creating. <laughs> um, bringing this thing to life um, is, this, is, is so important, I think, to what we do. And I think to address, I think, an, Another component of your question was just sort of the future of classical music in general. And I think, um, I know a lot of people are pessimistic about that, but I tend to be a little bit more on the, on the optimistic side. I think, you know, there's a reason that all of these older works have endured for so long. You know, I mean, pe people still play music from the 16th and 17th century all the time, and there's a reason that it's endeared. People are going to keep craving that kind of music, and of course, you know, Mozart and Beethoven and all of this stuff from the 17th and 18th century. And in addition, I think almost more than ever before, there's so many great new composers on the scene. And also, there's so many more musicians than there have been. I think there are, the conservatories are just being overloaded with applicants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, may, that could be a good or a bad thing. But I think, you know, a lot there, the interest in this art form is going to be there for a long time. And people, there's, it's going to endure, and it's been enduring for a reason. So... I, I tend to be more optimistic, but optimistic about it in general. Well, it's a huge question, um, and and there's a a lot of the answers are are I think rhetorical. I think we need to break down some of the parts of the question. I mean, what 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 are some of the essential differences between something we call the classical idiom versus something that's a popular idiom? And is it okay that something in the classical idiom becomes popular? Mm -hmm. And can something become popular music so embraced that it becomes a classic? I mean, there's, there's a lot of this semantic warfare that goes on. I, I think that 
for me, classical music in general, and then I'll speak specifically to, to vocal music, which I think is a very important distinction. Um, but to me, classical music embraces first and foremost a, a given structure that says that these pieces added up in these juxtapositions illuminate certain large aspects of us as human beings. Now, the difference between that and popular music is that popular music is essentially based on contemporary symbols that are articulating an immediate feeling of now versus classical music, which is articulating very m more often a bigger picture of the bigger items of what motivates human beings in general, sort of the river and different wells. Being labored with the past has never particularly bothered me because I see the past or, or different traditions or, or what we call them styles, and if you think about it, style is in fact, you can only use the word style in the context of a past tense. Schubert never thought about writing in a style, he thought about writing. And we call it a Schubert style because of this or that facts that we then identify. Again, based upon a kind of structural idea that informs us of the tools that genius used to articulate his now and his perception of, of the humanness that we are. And so we look through that prism. And I think that is quite fascinating. It informs me a great deal uh, about who I am as a person to, to go through the different contexts that, that illuminate the content that Schubert or Mozart or, or the 16th century wanted to say. And I think this conversation in classical music is very often either not uh, opened enough to our public today, it certainly is not embraced in our educational system anymore, which I think is a huge mistake, uh, but it is literally a conversation uh, that, that is happening in classical music, meaning that the music itself, the language of music and its symbols, in that particular piece, whether it's a Bruckner, or it's a Tchaikovsky, or it's a Brahms, or it's a Schubert, or it's a Mark Adamo, or it's a, or a John uh, Alden Carpenter, whatever it is, there is a conversation about being alive happening. And if you don't know that language, how are you going to have that conversation? I, and I'm, I'm taking some of this from, from the time I've spent in Gustav Mahler's works, because be the people either love Mahler, or they can't stand him. And a lot of people are frustrated with Mahler's music because it's a little bit like being at a dinner table with seven people and they're all having a wonderful conversation and you get the laughter and you get the sad and you get the pensive and you get the this and you get that, but you don't actually speak the language they're speaking, so you're kind of observing this thing and after a while it just damn well gets on your nerves and you want to go home, you know? And I think that that is part of the classical idiom. In this, I mean, this is a positive way. It's a very rich conversation meant to last meant to articulate something about our now that is connected to their now and hopefully connected to someone else's future now. And this conversation is a very large and beautiful, one of the great conversations. I am not in the least pessimistic about classical music because it's, it, it, to me that's a little bit of a... Uh, it, 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 it's like being pessimistic of the theory of gravity, you know? <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense. It, neither is it a theory, nor is it going to not be ever not be gravity. There will always be the attempt to tell the story by someone in musical language and poetic language what it meant to be alive. And, and that is what our classic idiom is. When in classical song, very often called art song, which I think is a, is a very strange description. Classic song is literally, as, as you alluded to also, Mark, earlier, uh, back to this prima la musica, poi la parola, classic song is a poem in and of itself, a work of art, a form of art, that marries itself or gets itself married <laughs> in a musical language. And those two entities, artistic entities, become a third art form. It's rather unique in the world of art. And Certainly, the word becomes tone, the tone becomes word, but they all operate, in my opinion, at a very sophisticated, very beautiful metaphorical relationship to the world of thought and, and feeling at the same time. It's, it's the Pascalian theory. It's the think with the heart, you know? It's this alive recognition. And I think that is the part of classical music that is not joyously described and invigorated amongst our public and amongst the general public uh, all the time to, to, to 
release some of this apprehension of being in a conversation where you don't know what the language is, or, or being disinformed of symbols that are very necessary to get the essence of some pieces that, that are being written. It is a big mistake, I think, in a, in a democratic society to not embrace not just music in education or curriculum. The idea that the arts and humanities are an elective is such an anathema to me as a human being, not just because I'm an, author, an, an artist. It doesn't make any sense to me. The arts and humanities are the blueprint of who we are as human beings. And these should be embraced. And the performing arts make those blueprints audible and visual. And it seems to me if, if, if we're not going to embrace that as a source of information for ourselves and a joyous celebration of what we have created through centuries and, and leave it as a sort of high end of the entertainment industry, and what does that mean to the discussion of politics and religion? Mm -hmm. How can you possibly have a rational conversation about politics and religion in today's society without understanding historical context and literary examples of people having the same conversation before or trying to move forward? I do not understand what we're doing to ourselves in this country. I simply don't understand. If you go back historically, countries that, that have dominated other countries, the first thing they did was either kill the intelligentsia burn the libraries, or forbid folk musicians. Mm -hmm. And what in the hell are we doing to ourselves today? We ignore the intelligentsia. We do not teach our own stories to our own people. And we clap because we think we're supposed to appreciate something artistic. And most of the information, by the way, if I may just keep my tirade going here, <laughs> most, of the, most of the discussion about classical music is done through the, through the eyes of people counting sales in some context or another. It has nothing to do with the phenomenon of classical music. Whether the radio goes up or down in appreciation or internet radio is taking off or reinvigorating radio or whether classical music is on television or not on television, these are all measurements of sales or God forbid, you know, what happened to Tower Records? We all sat there and went, how can this possibly happen, you know? Well, it does happen. We're in a different... What happened to Barnes & Nobles? I'm old enough that when Barnes & Nobles was coming on the market, we kind of went, oh my God, you know, we don't want retail bookstores. <laughs> we, you know, where's our independent bookstores? You know, where's the good books? You know, all this kind of, oh, this general kind of thing. And now we're going, oh, please, Barnes & Noble, everything's forgiven, come home. You know, but this is the way society is, this is the way we live, and we must embrace this. But it doesn't actually have anything to do with those of us, and I suspect most mm -hmm. of us in the room are dedicated in our lives to this, of protecting the flame of knowledge. It is not information, it is knowledge. It is who we are as people. And we have a responsibility in our generation to hold that flame, and it's the same flame that they held 250, 300 years ago, 3,000 years ago, or however off you want to believe that, and hand it to the next ones that they have to do that. And this contextual relationship, I think, is what we're missing in the invigorating dialogue of classical music. There's no question about whether it's popular or not popular, or going to last or not last. That's a waste of our time. Let's tell people what we're performing and why. We make things audible that are infinitely more interesting and infinitely more important than the people making them audible. Uh -huh. And another thing. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfectly timed because on my <laughs> cue, this is just the moment that we're going to elicit some questions from members of the audience. So if I'm not mistaken, there's a microphone set up at the end of, of this aisle. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look. I've never known an audience at UC Davis to be shy about asking questions. So um, anyone who's interested, go ahead. Why don't I ask, while someone's going there or multiple people are getting in line, let me ask a question because certainly some of this technology is in the service of mm -hmm. getting the audience out. I mean, Absolutely. even though you've just had your tirade, Tom, I mean, I would say is that you know you've been on the the the, the movie screens now, thanks to the HT broadcasts and other other ways that you think about you know the 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 values of some of that technology in the in the service of spreading. Oh, I think we live in a, fun, I think educational technology is quite frankly is one of the most exciting frontiers in, of, of, in front of us. I think we have more ways, that my tirade is about my frustration of, of how things have come to be or, or how I don't, want to, I don't want to have people lose their, their curiosity and their flame. My tirade is not, is not finger pointing and I think we actually live, the, the good news to all of this is very much embraced by technology. I think we have more 
possibility of ingratiating a wider public into the very specific rule called classic music than we ever have before. And, and I think that's everything from the, from the, from the ubiquitousness of a Facebook uh, world to the specificity of, of HD. The marvelous thing about HD, regardless of whose patent or branding or company they're doing it, is that we do have now technology that the representation in an artificial world called technology and, and screen and sound is truly representative of what's happening in a real time in a, in a, in a, on a all live situation. Um, you know, as, as much as we all love those wonderful uh, PBS specials through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, you know, we are in a new world. And I think that's the most important information. Have we solved the business model? Have we solved the accessibility? Have we, are we, are we actually by our fascination with HD in building and ingratiating a larger public or are we defining a new public? Those questions need to be asked regularly and examined regularly, in my opinion. But, so I see someone ready to ask a question. Go ahead. First of all, thank you for this wonderful discourse. This is really a treat to have the composer, the first singer to sing to uh, perform, and the uh, uh, members of the quartet to be here too. Thank you so much. But I have a question. I will, I will uh, come and see that uh, opera uh, in San Francisco, oh. and I have a question for you. Okay. In, in, this, uh, in this age of uh, industrial light and magic, Yes. Um, how uh, are you going to be involved in the staging uh, of the opera? Well, I'm not the director. Uh, Kevin Newbery is the director and Michael Christie is the conductor. Uh, I am fortunate in that, uh, bo both because the, uh, the leader of the company, David Gockley, it, trusts me as a, as a theater person as well as a composer, uh, that he and that, that uh, Kevin and I and Kevin's designer, uh, set designer, uh, David Corrins, will be doing the set. Uh, we've been involved in really thinking about what the environment to create uh, for the, you know, to best tell the story. And uh, this kind of links back to this question. I, I, I do want to wave, wave a tiny flag, not, not to be accused of being a technophobe, exactly, but I guess the, the idea of, of to the extent that if technology brings us closer, increases our ability to pay attention, I think it's a gorgeous thing. To the extent that it makes it more possible for, in, in your lovely distinction, for you know, knowledge or the experience of a concert to be rendered information, I think it's, it's a mixed blessing. Uh, but I, I, when you say in, in the age of industrial light and magic, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you why I, I, I thought of that now. Because one of the things that, that David Corrins, the designer, uh, wanted uh, was he said, I, I would really like the set to be one sculpture that is inflected by light, but I don't see a lot of big pieces moving in or the stage revolving or, or lots of, of mechanism mm. because the story itself is so archetypal. You know? So what we really have is an archaeological dig that is roughly divided into the upper level where the, uh, the contemporary uh, characters, for there are, there, there's a, there are contemporary observers and then the biblical characters are, uh, act out, are summoned by the longing of the contemporary characters in, into being. So you have layers that are literally, uh, the highest is the, is the present as we go deeper into the earth, we are going deeper into history. And one of the reasons I like about that, or, or I like that, that concept, is, is not just because I think it's apt uh, for the material and, and it solved the big technical problem that I needed to solve for the chorus to be able to materialize and dematerialize at a moment's notice, you know, but that it did, um, it did underline the kind of ritual aspect of, of theater, uh, which I would argue we're going to recreate in microcosm here with, with the quartet and, and Tom on stage. Mm. There is something about, to me, maybe this is a, you know, a sentimentality, but there is something about the notion of, of a, a space in which you know, the, uh, we're all breathing the same air and the event is happening in front of you. It is not something to which you, through which you can fast forward. It is not something that has been mixed and you know, manicured within an inch of its life. It's an event rather than a file. And that's, part of, that's the, the aesthetic that we're going for with the show. Thanks. See another question there? Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, my question has to do with the ways in which new music enters the repertory and becomes more or less classic. Um, I'm especially interested in the case of Little Women. 
Um, some of us here in the music department spent some time with this uh, piece last term oh, okay. in the context of a class on American opera, and it was really one of the few pieces that, has, that we studied that has found multiple performances in different venues, both professional and university. So I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the process by which that happened, but perhaps more generally uh, with Aristotle, we have an instance of very interesting co-commissioning uh, and so if others have thoughts as well about the ways in which new music enters your particular repertory, uh, those would also be welcome. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'll be very brief in, in the case of Little Women because I have no idea. I wrote it as well <laughs> as I possibly could. It was a very small commission. There was not... It was my first piece really on a national scale. And so I, I was mostly, you know, was, was I figured out how to do the piece, you know, I, I was... I wanted not to be embarrassing. I wanted it to be as good as possible. But no one was prepared for, for the reception that it got at the opening. And then David revived it, and then great performances became interested in it, and, and here we are. So uh, the, the short, I think the shortest answer, though, and I think there are other, the, 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 not so much the narrower, but the, um, the, the more present-day element of your question, which is how do we make sure that a piece doesn't happen in one corner of the room, which is, I think, a co-commissioning thing. Um, I, I, I think that, that Tom and, and the quartet could speak to that more readily. But, you know, I think what, how pieces get into the repertory is how they've always gotten into the repertory. Someone writes it because they feel they, they can. Other people believe in it. Mm. They show up, they tell their friends, and so on and so on and so on, as the commercial used to go. I think we also have to say, again, back to this consortium, this, this 10 presenter group. I mean, we read a lot in the papers of this symphony having problems, and I'm not, I don't mean contemporary with San Francisco, I mean, I mean organizations like Jacksonville that just simply don't exist anymore, or, or other places that are either presenters or, are, are falling apart or whatever. What we don't get to read about are the active presenters that are banding together and commissioning new pieces and getting artists that are regularly employed, you know, this this fantastic quartet in, in, a, in a year in a year where a couple of very major old recognized name quartets I'll leave them unnamed right now disbanded and said our world doesn't exist anymore here comes four wonderfully talented young people say no we're going to form a quartet and they've got their residencies and they're on tour and so forth so this you know this should be celebrated as, as, as well and and what we're doing with Aristotle and Billy Collins poem and, and Mark's music is is a wonderful now, and we go to Boston, and we go to, to New York, certainly will come up again, but it certainly has to be because organizations who accept the responsibility say, this is more important than being popular. This is what we're going to do. Hopefully it will catch on. Some things do, some things don't. But that's been the candidate of classical music all the time. You, you know the stories as well as I do of, of pieces that had disastrous premieres and then became legendary, like La Boheme, you know, or something like that. So a little bit, of, I appreciated your honesty, because it is a bit of a crapshoot on that level, but but it starts with the commitment of, of presenters that can make it possible to say, we are going to bring these composers and these artists together, and we are going to do this. And thank goodness. Gentlemen, and do you want to gentlemen. add to that? Yeah, and that's great. I mean, I think, you know, bringing new music to audiences, I mean, we, we play a lot of places, and a, a lot of audiences are still very afraid of new music. You know, we go to some series where they still say, like, can you keep it pre-1900 or something like that. <laughs> and you know, it is, so it's really refreshing to see that there is this consortium out there that is searching for that. And you know, and it's so, and even if you, I mean, uh, if you place it in a program with the class, it's so interesting to hear it juxtaposed against a uh, more traditional piece on the program. And uh, I think, and, and so the more exposure it gets, the more it's be gonna become part of the mainstream classical music repertoire. And I think just exposure like that is the most important thing. And people's mm. openness, even if you don't love it upon first listen, you know, getting used to that kind of language, it's just, it takes some time sometimes. And I think that kind of openness, open-mindedness is what, what it really needs. We, we do, part of our job is that we have to fight tooth and nail sometimes to get presenters to take new music, to get them mm -hmm. to take bar talk, which is not I know. Yeah. So it, we, you know, and it, so it's a collaboration between the quartet and, and the concert presenter um, to, to make the program, um, to make it right, to make it a really well-balanced um, program uh, that where the pieces inform each other um, in, in an interesting way so that both the piece has structure um, inside each individual work, but also there's some 
larger context for the whole you know, evening, which I think is, is something that's not thought about enough. So to have the, the opportunity to play this piece and to have a university that's open to doing a project like this and then for us to get to go out on the road with it is so wonderful. Um, and, and the first half, we, I, we haven't talked much about the first half, which is just the quartet. Um, well, I think, uh, oh, sorry, the first oh. half has a damo on it. <laughs> so yeah. the program is, um, is a Schubert quartet, a very mm. early Schubert quartet. Uh, and then we do um, a, a very early Webern, um, Anton Webern piece, which is basically a song without words before he right. became um, a, a serialist. Mm -hmm. um, this was really at the height of um, romanticism, right before it became something completely different. Um, and then your wonderful work, Intermission, um, uh, a very um, uh, wonderfully light, um, Puff of Air by Hugo Wolf, <laughs> the Italian serenade, uh, and then these great songs. Um, and, and the reason I'm telling you the whole program is because I think the pieces that don't involve you guys um, really do kind of illuminate the other works on the program. Um, Absolutely. The, the quartet is very, uh, the Webern is very, very vocal, and Schubert, of course, is a master of um, song. Uh, and this is, a, this is an early work from him that uh, I think highlights uh, where we were going to go into Hugo Wolf's world on the second half. So, um, so go ahead. So we have yeah. okay, time for one last question. I so much enjoyed uh, the presentation and uh, especially the tirade at the end. <laughs> the tirade? <laughs> and, uh, and I know that uh, our leadership at UC Davis is really trying hard to avoid the avalanche that's trying to cover up the humanities. But I have a question. Our son went to Steinhardt at NYU in music. And then he went out to the community at Universal Music Publications. And he had been taught for four years about quality. And as soon as he got there, they said, well, quality is nice, but saleability is what's important. So the question is, if you can answer it very in a, in a brief thing, how do we get our even at one of the finest music schools in the country, the academic word out to the material world, as uh, we say. I've never been known for brief answers, so I'll, I'll do well, I think we'll give Mark the last word. Well, I was going to be brief about this, because this actually links, I think is linked to the previous question, which is about, you know, how do you, you know, how do pieces get into the canon? And I... I actually used to teach at the Steinhardt School, and one of the things that I told my composers is that we do not go into music in order to take part in the music business. Bingo. We put up with the music business in order to make music. You know, and I think that in, in the same way that if, when, you're, when you're going to the, to the Steinhardt School, if you are committed to quality, then you don't, you know, and someone says at Universal Music, well, quality is great, but saleability is great, well, then you look for another job. I think I speak for all of us no, here. You're, Mark, you're, and, what, and again, you know, the business of music is the forum in which music takes place. Yeah. And sometimes they live a tremendous contradiction to one another. And, and yet they mutually exist, and you just have to, you, you can't say one is against the other, the other one's for it. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Right, I mean, it's, but I mean, for example, as, as you were saying, as, as quartets will disband saying, this is not the world in which I live, mm. another quartet say, actually, this is the world that I want to create, mm -hmm. or the world in which I want to take part. I think that there's a, a, a way in which we all, for good or ill, um, you know, need to make the entrepreneurial aspects of our lives fall in line with, with why we're doing this to begin with. I mean, listen, Mozart ate in the kitchen. Do you know, with, you know he, he, that wasn't, a, it wasn't much of a business then either. Do you, know? <laughs> you, you do it because you, you feel like you've got, you, you hear something, you need other people to hear it, and you find a way, and the, the colleagues, whether they be other musicians or, or good souls in the business, because you know, ultimately there is no music business, there are colleagues. There's that, the person leading, you know, this, this particular presenting organization, or there's a person leading an opera company with whom you don't agree, and so you work with A and not with B, I, I think. To answer your question specifically about how can we invite the larger and more unwashed public to the, to the brilliance and genius and wonderfulness of academia, you know, I, th I think it's just hugely important that we never let the polemic enter into the conversation that, that it's either one or the other. And that, and that we don't let ourselves be an ivory tower of, of 
substitute standards, nor do we not ever open our doors or windows so people understand how hard we work to understand the symbols that add up to something greater than the sum of their parts. And, and that's why one of the reasons I'm so enthusiastic about educational technologies, I, I, I think we need to em embrace the phenomenon of iTunes and iTunes University. There are a lot of people accessing a lot of podcasts because they want to go to history class again, because they want to hear somebody talk about something they don't quite understand. The Khan Academy is not an accident. It's here to stay. These are, these are major events. The word podcast came into the dictionary three years ago <laughs> as, a, as an actual a term. I mean, I think there's a lot of a lot of positive things to embrace. I also don't think that classical music has any responsibility to be the ubiquitous musical language of everybody. It's always going to be a specific audience because it is dealing with a structure and a, and a use of symbols that will, that will mean something. It's an additive kind of process. But what I think is terribly exciting today is that we can open the windows and open the doors while we do what we do in a specific environment, whether that's called academia or a performing classical environment. And, and to dovetail with you, Mark, finally, it is that all of this, all of this digital world, whether it was VHS or television or all of that, I mean, when television was invented, everybody said, oh my God, look at the educational world, it's gonna be a boom. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, right? <Yes. laughs> but all of the digital, even all this digital stuff that I'm so excited about, if it isn't about invigorating the person to the live experience, the exchange of lively air and blood with one another as human beings in the celebration of, of a musical moment or a theatrical moment or a literary moment or a visual arts moment, if it isn't about that at the end of the, end of the day, then it's, in my opinion, unsuccessful. It is, has to always be about invigorating going to the theater exchanging the ideas with your colleagues, exchanging, being alive in your curiosity of what you don't understand or what maybe you don't even agree with. I think this is hugely important. Well, we have come to the end, and I want to be a little bit of a stage manager, and I want the very last thing to be our expression of thanks. But before that, let me um, fulfill my role, and as we always do here, is to thank all of your for coming to let you know that the next Chancellor's Colloquium will be on May 22nd. Um, this will feature Leslie Berlowitz. Dr. Berlowitz is the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So that's sure to be an exciting event. I said it's the end, but there is a little bit of a coda in that there is a reception waiting for us in the lobby, and I think there might be opportunities for individuals to continue the conversation with Mark, Tom, Nelson, and Daniel. Those sounds like four other evangelists, perhaps. <laughs> um, but in any event, so it let us... sounds like the fiery furnace. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, I, 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 let's thank all of our guests here and, and tell them what a wonderful colloquium they've, they've given us. Thank you.